Not too long ago, I built a NAS for this channel for $150 with various used components, but didn't include the cost of the drives. I did this for, in my opinion, good reason, but not including the cost of the drives made quite a few people upset. So after a bit of research, bargain hunting, and troubleshooting, I present this. A $150 NAS that you can actually build, but maybe shouldn't. Now before we start talking about this NAS, I want to go ahead and mention the sponsor of today's video, NordPass. If you're watching this video, I imagine you spend a fair amount of time on the internet and have quite a few different accounts. And if you're not using a password manager, you might be in a bit of trouble. Fortunately, there's NordPass, an easy to use password manager created by the same cybersecurity experts that built NordVPN. NordPass lets you store all of your passwords in one place, so you never have to worry about forgetting them, and also generates complex passwords to keep your account safe. I don't have any intention of fear-mongering, but in today's climate, cyber attacks, and more specifically data breaches, are a significant threat. If you use the same or similar passwords across your social media, e-commerce, and financial accounts, you could be in serious trouble if any one of those companies mishandles your precious data. By having random and complex passwords across all your accounts, you're much less likely to get hacked, and NordPass does all of that hard work for you. You can use NordPass on up to six devices, including on your mobile device, desktop, web browser, and more. And one cool feature I personally appreciate is the ability to import passwords from a CSV file, which made getting up and running with NordPass literally only take a few minutes. There are a lot of other features purely focused on security, from their data breach scanner to their advanced encryption algorithm and zero-knowledge architecture. Right now, you can get an exclusive NordPass deal plus four additional months for free by going to nordpass.com slash hardwarehaven, or you can just use the code hardwarehaven at checkout. Step up your online security and get signed up with NordPass today. In my $150 NAS video prior, I didn't include the cost of the drives for a few reasons. Well, really just one reason, I guess. See, when you buy a NAS from someone like Synology, they don't usually include the drives. So my goal with that video was to price it in a way that was comparable to other NAS devices. This makes sense to me, but I could also see why some people felt misled. So that led me to see if I could build a reasonable NAS solution for $150. Now, technically, I could have bought a Raspberry Pi or any computer that costs less than $150, set up SMB, and technically, it's network attached storage. But that wouldn't be very useful or challenging. So, I set out to build a good bang for the buck NAS that I think could cover the needs of someone looking to spend less than a couple hundred dollars. The criteria that I landed on is as follows. First, it obviously needs to be $150 or less, but I wanted that to include literally everything from drives to cables and anything in between. The only thing I'm not including are things that are needed for the setup, like a keyboard, monitor, and mouse, or the install media. I also needed this build to be somewhat available for purchase to anyone watching, at least here in the US. So, I made sure to avoid local deals and got all of this from online retailers. Although, if you're looking to build something similar, you'll probably still need to have a bit of patience and get lucky on a couple used eBay deals. I also wanted to make sure that this build had a decent amount of storage. It's pretty easy to find cheap one terabyte or smaller drives, but I imagine that most people wanting to build a budget NAS are at least looking for a bit more than that. So I made my goal at least three to four terabytes of usable space. I also wanted to have some amount of redundancy. So that means at least two drives would be needed. With this being heavily budget oriented, speed was a little bit less of a concern. So my goal here was to have a gigabit connection and try to essentially saturate that gigabit connection with reads and writes. With all of that in mind, I set out to find a system that would fit all of the above criteria. I think I did a decent job here, but if you think you have a better system in mind, make sure and put that in the comments below. I knew that trying to get at least two, three to four terabyte drives was going to tear pretty heavily into my budget, so I started with that. I could have gone with new one terabyte drives to make my budget still work, but that just seemed like such a small amount of space. So I eventually landed on these used HGST Ultrastar four terabyte drives from GoHardDrive 
for $40 a piece. These are listed on Amazon technically, but are sold from GoHard Drive. They don't give any info on how long or where they were used, but they include a one year warranty. I have no idea what the renewal process is for these, other than apparently wiping the smart data, but I decided to roll the dice here just to get a little bit more capacity. If you're looking for a good deal but don't want to take as big of a risk, you could also check out some of their drives that have three or even five year warranties, but also cost a bit more, as I imagine these are newer and have fewer power on hours. Now, if you're really upset right now that I'm buying used storage, well, why are you watching a $150 NAS video? If you want new storage, you'll probably just have to save up and spend more. Like I said earlier, these cost $40 each and also paid around $8 for shipping, putting our current total at $88. Now I needed to find something to put these in. Something super low powered like a Raspberry Pi was out of the question considering I would have to buy hats, adapters, and a case for these drives, so I decided to look into the used desktop market. It can take some work, but you can usually find used desktops with something like a 4th gen i3 for fairly cheap, and after looking through eBay listings for a solid desktop with two drive bays, I came across this Dell Optiplex 3020MT with an Intel Core i3-4130. It also has 4GB of DDR3 memory and a 500GB hard drive. The 4130 is fairly efficient and powerful enough for most simple NAS services, and while the 4GB of memory isn't a lot, it should still be fine for a system like this. The seller accepted my $20 offer, and I ended up paying $37.60 with shipping and taxes, putting our total now at around $126, which meant I only had $24 left. I was tempted to buy a $20 SSD for the boot drive, but realized that my system that I bought only came with a single drive caddy, so I had to spend six more dollars on Amazon for a second, leaving me with only $18 total. Even if I found an SSD for that much, I would still need a third SATA cable to complete the build, which typically costs at least $5. To stick to the budget, I just landed on getting a USB 3 flash drive for $10. While many operating systems don't recommend this, some work just fine being booted from a flash drive, like Unraid for example. But this whole flash drive thing might not have worked out as planned, but I'll come back to that shortly. For the operating system, I was tempted to use TrueNAS since that's my go-to option, but with only 4GB of RAM, ZFS wasn't going to be an incredible option. Unraid would be great for a home system like this, but isn't free and would definitely push my budget past $150. So I decided to go with Open Media Vault. Booting Open Media Vault from a flash drive isn't necessarily supported or recommended, but it does include an optional plugin to help minimize the number of writes to the boot drive, and this is specifically made for booting from flash memory. So I decided to give it a shot. With the components ready, it was time to put everything together. Normally, I would disassemble a system like this and thoroughly dust out and clean it, but it was bitter cold out and I was also a bit pressed for time. So I just took out the 500 gigabit hard drive, removed the CPU cooler and old paste, and gave it a quick dusting outside. With all the big dust bunnies and such out of the case, I replaced the thermal paste and reattached the cooler. The drives fit easily enough into the two caddies and slotted into place. And that was basically it, since the boot drive is just a flash drive. To install Open Media Vault, I downloaded the most recent stable release ISO, and then used Bolena Etcher to flash it to a different USB flash drive. As with pretty much any Linux install, I plugged in the install flash drive, booted up the system, and then, at least on my desktop, hit F12 to select which drive I wanted to boot from. But here is where I ran into a pretty big issue. See, the installation went fine but whenever it came time to remove the install media and reboot, the Optiplex just wouldn't boot from Open Media Vault. I tried running in UEFI and legacy modes and different variations of the installation, but just no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to work. Out of curiosity, I installed TrueNAS Scale on the flash drive and it booted up just fine. So I'm still not entirely sure why I couldn't get this to work with Open Media Vault. I'm sure someone's going to kindly let me know in the comments, and that's actually greatly appreciated. Realistically, 
TrueNAS ran just fine even with 4GB, and I could have installed that and moved on, but I wanted to get OpenMedia Vault working. I ended up just installing it on a 128GB SSD and calling it a day. SSDs are pretty cheap right now, so realistically, I probably should have just spent $15 on one and about $6 on a SATA cable, and ended up just slightly over my $150 budget, but I really, really wanted to stay under $150. Oh well. When installing OpenMedia Vault, you can, for the most part, just use the default settings. I decided to set my hostname as Haven Vault and set a super secure password as always. For most of this, you can typically use the default option or the obvious answer. Once finished, I removed the install drive and rebooted to find myself right at home in Debian Linux, which is what OpenMedia Vault is built on. At this point, I was in the clear to unplug any peripherals and move over to my desktop PC. You should be able to access this from the hostname, which is in my case, havenvault.local, but if that doesn't work, you can just use the local IP address, which can be seen on the monitor output here. In the web browser, I navigated to http colon forward slash forward slash havenvault.local, or you could use your IP address here, and then logged in with admin as the user and openmediavault as the password. I won't be doing a super deep dive into openmediavault, partly because I'm just not super familiar with it, but also because I don't want this video to get too long. But I'll at least talk through the main steps of getting everything up and running. If you're looking for an in-depth guide, I recommend checking out Techno Dad Life's video explaining basically all the ins and outs of Open Media Vault. Before setting up any NAS stuff, I installed OMV Extras, which gave me access to things like Docker and Portainer, as well as the Flash Storage plugin I mentioned earlier. Even though I'm using an SSD, I still like the idea of less frequent writes to my boot drive. To get storage set up, I first wiped each of our two drives and then set them up in a RAID 1 mirror. This means that one drive can fail and we won't lose any of our data as long as we replace the failed drive without also losing the other. Then I mounted the file system that was created with our RAID drive and made a shared folder called Haven Vault. To manage access to the NAS, I created a new group and user, both called Haven. When I created this shared folder a second ago, I just set it to allow all users, but I could edit the access control list to only allow the Haven group or user ID later on if I wanted to. After that, I set up an SMB share with the Haven Vault folder and then enabled the SMB service. With all the setup done, I was able to navigate to the share in my file browser and access Haven Vault using my credentials. Everything functioned as expected, and I was able to maintain around 110 megabytes per second with sequential read and writes, which realistically is the limit of a gigabit connection. The i3-4130 was barely being utilized, so this NAS could definitely be used to run a few services like Jellyfin or Home Assistant or whatever else you wanted. There is one pretty substantial issue though, and that is our drives. While they seem to work just fine, they get pretty noisy. Some of this might be due to the condition they're in, but it's also common for drives like this to be pretty loud, as they're designed to be in a data center, not an office PC. They also got a bit warm, with one of the drives reporting a max temp of 57 degrees Celsius, although I think that's acceptable with these. I'm planning to move these drives over to my backup NAS and see how well they hold up over time. If I have anything to report, I'll make sure to put it in the description or comments. But here's the question you might be asking yourself, should I build this? And the answer is maybe. If you're looking for an inexpensive NAS and you're happy to do some budget shopping, tinkering, and take a little bit of a risk, this is definitely a route you could go down. However, if you're looking for something quiet, efficient, and reliable, you might want to save up and spend just a little bit more. For around $340, you could buy two brand new 4TB NAS drives and an Asus Store Drive Store 2, both of which would come with pretty solid warranties and get you about the same performance, if not better. Or you could still tinker and build your own system, but with new drives. It, it really just comes down to you, your needs, and your budget. But with any NAS you buy or build, make sure to set up at least one backup solution if you want to keep your data safe, even if you're using some type of RAID. 
If you're wanting to learn more about DIY network attached storage or servers, you can watch my original $150 NAS video that I still use on this channel all the time. Or maybe check out this video here where I convert an old gaming PC into a multi-purpose server with Unraid. Also, don't forget to click the link down in the description below to get an exclusive NordPass deal plus four additional months for free. That's about it for this one though. So as always, thanks for watching, stay curious, and I really hope to see you in the next one.